Hi there, this is Dr. Jessica Lilly. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and the Director of Pre Pediatric Endocrinology at the Mississippi Center for Advanced Medicine. Uh, I'm interviewing my longtime friend and uh, mentor, Dr. Craig Alter from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, I was a resident there and got to go through his endocrine clinic and it really did solidify my desire to go into pediatric endocrinology. And so we're here this um, morning to talk about um, the shortage of pediatric endocrinologists that we're already facing that seems to be looming larger as we look into the future. Um, and so I know not everyone is as lucky as I was to have great mentorship. And so um, and as a former president of Pediatric Endocrine Society, Dr. Alter has um, spoken widely about this issue um, and is uh, an expert in what we need to do next. So um, good morning. It's so good to see you again, Craig. I've, I've missed getting to see my CHOP family. Yeah, thank you. It's I'm glad we're having this discussion because this is a really important discussion and very dear to my heart. Yes. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Um, I think one of the, the big issues is that, um, you know, trying to get this um, conversation elevated um, outside of our specialty, because every pediatric endocrinologist knows that there aren't enough of us. We know what our wait times look like. We know how far people are um, having to drive to come see us. Um, and we know what a disruption that is to our patients' lives. And we know how stressful it is to us. And so, um, you know, uh, trying to, to talk to our colleagues in other areas of medicine is going to be really important. And so I'm thankful for Medscape for allowing us the opportunity to, you know, try to disseminate this conversation outside of our meetings and outside of our workrooms and the places where we all are discussing this. Um, and I'm sure our, our colleagues over in other pediatric specialties like rheumatology and nephrology uh, are, are having these same kind of struggles. And so what's pertinent to us will be pertinent to everyone who are taking care of children with chronic diseases. Um, and so in, in, you know, in, uh, to get started and to ha have a better idea of the scope of the problem, tell us a little bit about what we're facing, from what, what you've worked on um, in your advocacy. Um, how bad is the problem? Well, I think that without even getting quantitative, we're all feeling it. Really, you said that. We're feeling the wait times. We're feeling like our services are definitely needed. There are a lot of people that need pediatric endocrinologists, yet we have less people going into the field. We're still filling most of the positions. It's not like we're getting no one to go into the fields. We're still getting amazing candidates. But there's no question that the, there are too many unfilled slots my colleagues around the whole country are really feeling it. And I, you know, we're, we're all one big family. And so my job, my, my hope is that we can improve the situation. It's not going to be overnight, but I'm feeling not as representative of Children's House of Philadelphia, but a representative of our entire pediatric endocrine family. Right. And so I know, you know, when I, I applied for a fellowship, it was very program to program, a very informal, um, you know, you would get an offer at one place before you could interview another and had to hurry up and decide whether to, you know, accept it. Um, so that was quite some time ago. Um, and we've moved over to a formal match. And I think the match system for, um, for fellowship applications has really, um, it, it has um, illuminated a lot of the problem that was, was kind of um, developing. And so we're seeing that, you know, while, while yes, we're, we're filling most of our match spots at places like CHOP and, you know, um, and places that have a long history, um, you know, a lot of our other programs are going on field. And we're looking at, what, a 50% match rate uh, or, or you know, that we're leaving maybe half our spots on field. Is that what we saw with the most recent match? Yeah, a little, a little better than that, but that's the ballpark. Right. So, so not, 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 not 100%. And, and, and we all know that we could definitely use every single one of them. Um, meanwhile, we're, we're thinking about, you know, who are going to replace all the giants in the field that are, are going to be retiring. Um, and we know um, we, we want to make sure that we are matching a lot of that academic rigor and, um, and, and the, the number of work hours that we, um, we need. Um, meanwhile, we're having more children get sick with um, endocrine conditions. Type 2 diabetes was unheard of in the 80s, and now it's about 15% of the patients that I see with diabetes. Um, and we're seeing a lot of other you know, um, kinds of conditions that are, are increasing. Um, we know that type 1 diabetes um, itself is increasing gradually year over year. And so the, the, the needs are growing. Um, and so I know, um, you know and, and for a lot of us, you know, uh, trying to, to get people to think about endocrinology as a specialty, um, but we're also busy. We can't really, you know, talk to medical students and residents and people who, you know, um, might need to kind of just see what the specialty is. Because we all know if people see pediatric endocrinology, they won't want to do anything else. It's the best specialty. It's, you know, we have exactly. the best clients, we have the best patients. What do you love about being a pediatric endocrinologist? 
Well, before I answer that, I just want to make one comment that when you talk about the match rates, some of the positions are being filled after the match. Yes, that's and true. I, I, and I feel like some of that energy and excitement to fill the spots after the match should be done before the match. Right. So that if you're in a program and you say, wow, we didn't fill, but let me see who's out there that is undifferentiated in terms of their career and that we could talk to and get them excited about our amazing field. I feel like that has to happen earlier. I agree. And we are trying to attack that earlier. I think that's really helpful. So, so what things, when, when you have residents come through your clinic, how do you try to sell them on pediatric endocrinology? You know, what, what features of our specialty do you think really make it an attractive field? That's a really important question because I'm at a very big program. We have 31 faculty uh, physicians or something like that. And when people rotate through, they're not always spending time with one person. I think it's an advantage if they really spend time with one dedicated person. And it's also a disadvantage. The advantage is they're going to see a little special bone disease. They're going to see hyperinsulinism. They're going to see the variety by seeing many doctors, but the intimacy is lost. So I recognize that. But I feel like sometimes I watch and I hear more complaining about this computer system. And that's not what the prospective student really wants to hear. They want to see the exciting parts of the field. So I think first of all, is that our job when we have someone captured, like a resident or even a medical student, is not just to show them the experience of that moment, but take out your great stories. Take out that story of that person that you thought would have just basic short stature and turned out to have severe hypothyroidism. We all have patients like that. Talk about those. Have those cases at your fingertips because they're all super exciting. Talk to the, the learner, the student, the resident, and find out what things interest them. Find out more about themselves. Because if you think that you're going to model them into your own research mold, maybe they're not interested in the research world. They're interested in more inter just clinical issues. So I really think that we have to know, spend the time for each person, learn what they're interested in, share some of your excitement, not just the day-to-day -day events, and kind of throw the complaining out till the next day. Right. Well, I think it would help if we all had protected time to teach. Um, so many times we're having to see this, you know, overrun schedule because of the shortage um, and because of the demand. And so we're seeing double, triple book clinics while we have a learner with us. And so, you know, really trying to take that sacrifice to have protected time so we can, you know, have some exposure to the field and, um, and have even, you know, our, our residents who rotate through, you know, be able to spend a little bit more time with each patient and, and have those conversations. I think that's really important. Um, I know I personally, I was as a first year uh, medical student, um, had an early lecture from Dr. Uh, Jennifer Najar on congenital adrenal um, hyperplasia. Um, and so it's, you know, one of the most fascinating uh, conditions in any field, I, I would argue. Um, and, and to have a, a queen like her, you know, lead me through the pathway. Um, and then I, I walked up to her after the lecture and I'd come into med school interested in pediatric endocrinology. So I had some um, family members with type 1 diabetes and growth hormone deficiency and Addison's, just kind of an unusual exposure, you know, just personally. Uh, but I walked up to her and said, you know, gosh, that was an interesting lecture. I'd love to come to clinic with you. And so she just took me to clinic with her. Um, and so I started going as a first year medical student. And she, um, you know, was a, a wonderful mentor to me through um, all of medical school and drew me back to do my fellowship at Vanderbilt, too. And so that, that longstanding relationship is so important. Um, and so I, I still call her now with cases over a decade into practice. Um, and so I, I think that if everybody had someone like that, you know, um, to, to try to, you know, talk about you know, all the things that we love about what we do. And she really understood that. She, she had a lot of residents who came to diabetes camp with her or who did uh, learning sessions with medical students with her um, just to try to, you know, really increase exposure to what it is that we do. Um, because I think that once people get a glimpse of the specialty, they can actually consider it. Um, I think there are so many other, you know, highly demanding 
uh, rotations that, you know, that grab people's attention. And um, there, there's all this, you know, um, hand waving about how we don't make any money and, oh, it's such a long fellowship and all these kind of negatives that people don't even look. Um, and so I, th I think that, you know, we, we do need to talk about things like, you know, workload and call schedules and reimbursement, all those important things. But I, I think that, you know, for me, once I fell in love with pediatric endocrinology, the rest of that didn't matter so much. Um, and then even, you know, I remember coming into your clinic as a resident and, and, and it just you, you look like you had so much fun every day at work, um, even though, you know, you were working very, very hard. You know, you love taking care of your patients and it was just really contagious. Um, and so I thought, gosh, if everybody could come through here, we would have a lot more pediatric endocrinologists. Yeah, well, that, that I'm glad you have that memory. I I love my job. Do I love every minute of it? No. And I, yeah, it's a job, it, right? It, it, now, when I talked about really spending the time with each learner, that's already someone who's captured. So the next question is, how do we find more people to even expose them? And so we, and in the society, the Pediatric Endocrine Society, have the Discovery Program. Are you familiar with that program? Yes. It's a relatively new program, and we did it knowing that we need more people to enter the field and part of the workforce issues. So that program, which is still in its infancy, we have up to 60 right now either medical students or young residents first and sometimes second year where we're essentially giving them uh, some travel allowance and also free uh, entrance to our annual meeting and we think that the last year the program went really well we don't have any tracking numbers to see if this is going to make a difference in the future but it's right now we think it's a great program it still involves each institution finding candidates for that. It's not like the medical students are going to open up an email and just say, sure, we'll do this. So it's not a, it's not the answer to the whole uh, issues, but it's a great program, really shed a lot of excitement. And I look forward to seeing if some of those candidates from last year down the road enter our field. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned our, our annual meeting, it's so important that we all get together and don't remain siloed in our own experiences. Um, I think that there are many ways to practice pediatric endocrinology. Um, I'm in a multi-specialist, you know, it's a specialty group. I have some friends who went that direction too. Um, but it, as a resident and fellow, all you see are academic pediatric endocrinologists who are balancing research and patient care. Um, but there are a variety of ways to impact patient care with our expertise. Um, I know um, good friends who went into industry and who are impacting from that direction and uh, people who are, you know, practicing in rural areas like me or in um, private practice in, in metropolitan areas. There are so many different um, I, I kind of uh, uh, opportunities for experience that I think are important to shine a light on. And we can do that better at annual meetings um, rather than in, in uh, the places where the learning is taking place. Um, so we can show people, you know, if, if they, I know for me, I was really nervous about pursuing Pease Endocrine because I, I really cared a lot about the plight of children in Mississippi. Um, I grew up here. Um, we have a lot of challenges and a lot of struggles. Um, and I knew that there were a lot of um, kids here who were going without care um, and had a lot of people tell me, you'll never be able to, to, um, to practice uh, medicine there. There's no way that that, that model is going to work. And, and so we, we figured it out. Um, but we, we can share this with one another by, you know, coming to national meetings and staying engaged um, with the, um, the society so we can, you know, talk to each other about ways that we can improve access, improve care delivery, all the ways that we, um, you know, ha have learned on our own so we, we can um, just share that information. I think those are amazing points. The annual meeting to me is, it's just so much fun. And we see people that we were co-fellows with across the country, that we met at meetings then. We meet new people. Uh, we hear lots of stories. It's just, it's just a great opportunity to be excited by your field and to learn things. It's not even just about learning information. I think half of it is the concept that we're seeing each other, meeting new and old friends. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and it's, it's wonderful because, I, you know, if I have a patient who's moving, I'm near a military base. And so often, you know, patients are you know, asking for a recommendation for the next city they're moving to. or um, And so uh, it, it's been interesting to say, oh, yes, I, I do know somebody in that city um, because we're such a, a small field. We, we know each other. It feels kind of like a family. Um, so um, and if people ask, oh, do you know um, so-and-so? It, usually the answer is yes. You know, we, we get to interact with each other a lot. Yeah. I also like what you said a few minutes ago that the role and each job of a pediatric endocrinologist, it changes over time. And sometimes it's unique to their situation. And I will tell you, this is going to sound funny, but when I started, I was a, a medical student and I was working with Dr. the amazing Dr. John Krigler at Boston Children's Hospital. And I said I wanted to do a fellowship in pediatric endocrinology with the goal of doing, have a clinical role. I wanted to do just a small amount of research and be mostly clinical. And he said to me with this beautiful Southern accent, there was no such type of position that if you go into pediatric endocrinology, you're going to be doing predominantly research. And that led to a discussion because if I was going to do all research, I would have stayed in, in physics and math. Right? So even before medicine, so it was uh, very interesting. And even when I finished my fellowship at the Children's House of Philadelphia, that the great Lester Baker, uh, who was head of our division then, said to me, Craig, we would love to have you stay here. Uh, you won the teaching award of our fellows and you're blah, 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 blah. But if you stay here, you'll have to do three quarters research. And I said, well, I want to do mostly clinical care. And so I left there, went to UMass, which was amazing. They really, really cared about clinical care and teaching. And then I came back once CHOP said, you know what? We're opening up all these satellites. We would need someone to do all clinical care and education and grand round speaking and chapters. And they said, that's the job I'm talking about. Yes. And that's, yes. yeah. So it, the roles have changed and each person can they can invent new roles. They, there are people here who do endocrinology part-time and do some unique positions within their own institutions. Some are in private practice. So, you know, we're all, we're all part of the same family, but we all find our own answers. That's right. Absolutely. So, um, well, I, I'm really excited for the future of our field and, you know, and for, you know, uh, the, the ways that we're, we're all working to, to address these issues um, what about reimbursement? Um, I know that's something that comes up a lot, you know, that we, we really do kind of, you know, um, come, come in the back of the line when it comes to, um, to reimbursement for the work that we do. And we work really hard. Um, I, I know um, for, for me, um, you know, uh, having medical school loans and then facing another three years after residency graduation of PGY something pay um, in a, a large city was, was, was kind of um, uh, daunting. And so um, I've looked at my friends who were starting to, to get real jobs and, um, and knew that we were getting even further behind, um, you know, as we were you know, having to live in a higher cost of living area and, um, you know, continue to, um, to, to work to, you know, toward those goals. And then to, to start out feeling really behind and, and then have a, a lower compensation than other physicians that I had gone to medical school with. And so um, I, I know that that's kind of a tough sell sometimes. And then we say, oh, and guess what? You're going to get to be on call a lot more. And you're going to get to work longer hours and, you know, and, and balance all these other obligations like inpatient service time and research time and, you know, um, fighting for your own salary with grant applications. There's just a, a, there are a lot of challenges that, you know, we you know, kind of face coming into to sort of practice. And so, you know, what, what work are we doing um, as a specialty to better advocate for ourselves at the table? So we're working with the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, there are some high level meetings coming up and, and ongoing with the uh, program directors. And we're really trying to push for better reimbursements with the uh, more intellectual non-procedural fields. So not just endocrinology, but nephrology and things like that. And we're hoping to make progress. It's not going to be overnight. We realize that it's a very important issue. Mm -hmm. And, and and it's tough too because you know we, we are com, com, compared to the average American we're 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 well compensated for what we do 
Um, but when you, you look at other positions, we, we know that, um, that there's a lot of inequity, um, especially when you look at um, the uh, reimbursement for taking care of a child versus taking care of an adult. And I think it really you know, shines a light on um, the, the um, importance of children in our society. Um, if you if you look at some of our lowest paid workers across the across professions, whether you're looking at education or taking you know, into consideration child care workers and, you know, um, and, and then those of us who take care of children as physicians, I, I, I think we as a society say that we care about children. But when the, the rubber hits the road and when the dollars start, start coming out, we, we realize that that maybe we don't care as much as we say we do. And so I, I really, you know, I, you know, think we need to. to focus on um, who we're serving here and, and the, the importance of all the, the years of life that we have the opportunity to impact is, is a big deal. Well, I totally agree with you. Uh, we're trying to send some experts uh, for the, at these meetings. I, I'm not one of those people, but I agree that it's, it's very important. It, it devaluates children. If we're getting paid less for this, there's a lot of, a lot of things that could be said, and I'm hoping we make some progress there. But I agree. It's not like, we don't make a good living. We do. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just relative to uh, other fields. It's ridiculous how much less we get compared to others, even our adult colleagues. Right. Right. And so, but you know, I, I think that you know, uh, getting our head above the water. Um, you know, I, I think it's so um, easy to just put our heads down and work, 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 and and deal with the the high volume of um, demands that are coming toward us. Um, I think we just have to all take the time to pause and realize that we're advocating for ourselves, yes, but also we're advocating for our patients because the better we can make this specialty, the more attractive we can make this specialty, the better care delivery will be for the children that we serve. And so it's not a self-serving interest to, you know, really, you know, work on, you know, making sure that our quality of life as pediatric endocrinologists is um, desirable to others. Um, and and we, we know that the the better we make this look, the better it actually is, the more of us there will be. And And then, you know, Meanwhile, I'm hopeful for a cure of type 1 diabetes. I'd love to be put out of a job. Um, that would be a good problem to have. Um, but meanwhile, that the work is there. We need to address it. Well, I've enjoyed our time this, uh, together so much this morning. Um, and I know um, it, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful we can get other people to care as much as we do about pediatric endocrinology and the patients that we take care of. Um, but um, you know, I, I know um, you have a breadth of information um, and, and just a wealth of knowledge that you've been so generous to share. And so um, any closing thoughts as we um, wrap up our time together today? Well, I'm one who believes that everyone has something to teach me and to share amongst each other. So I feel like if anyone here listening has any good ideas about either promoting the field, increasing the reimbursements, or just anything to share, uh, Don't just keep it yourselves. Share it with the society, the Pediatric Endocrine Society. Contact the board by just either going, if you're a member, just go onto your internet and send a message to, you can send it to me, Craig Alter, and I'll share it with the proper person. It may not be me. And I'm really happy to take your ideas and let it generate some discussion. So I appreciate everyone's good thoughts. Well, I, I think that maybe, you know, just keeping this conversation going is so important. We, you know, I think COVID, you know, uh, really slowed some momentum down, you know, um, and, and, you know, trying to solve some of these problems. But I feel like we're, we're in a new new era and a new phase of, you know, kind of thinking about what's next in medicine um, and, and how to, to, um, to make things better for the people who are coming behind us. And so thank you for all that you do for pediatric endocrinology and for, and for all the people that you have, have taught and mentored. Um, and uh, we, we look forward to adding more to those ranks. Okay, thanks. Thank you for doing this interview. 